So Sorry. if we go through and look at it, four we did in class, and we just identify the bonds present. Once we've got the bonds, we can then go through and identify the bond, then identify the force. Once we've got the forces, we can now compare between the two compounds to decide which one has the stronger force. Remember, virtually all of our physical properties are dictated based off of the interactions of forces, not the interactions of bonds. Right? And because I just witnessed a horrible lecture on this, I just want to kind of clarify. When we're looking at melting point and boiling point, you will hear people reference polar and nonpolar. It is a horrible usage of terms. Polar and nonpolar are way too vague and do not differentiate enough to be able to dictate anything with intermolecular forces okay, or physical phases. So if you hear people say, oh, well, that one has a higher melting point because it's polar, feel free to call them out for being stupid. Okay? What they're using is an inappropriate terminology that just does not make sense. Okay? Where that polar and nonpolar is coming from is a horrible nuance back to the bonds. Well, we could say, well, carbon and hydrogen is nonpolar, okay? whereas oxygen and carbon is polar. Okay? So the polar covalent one clearly has the stronger interaction. Well, what comes from that? People then going through and saying, when we do a boiling point, what happens to the chemical bond? Well, they break the bond. No, you don't break the bond. So don't start referencing things based off of the bonds. You need to be referencing them based off of the forces. Okay, so we've got work for three, so we'll skip over that one and look at two. So when we go up to two, what we want to do is classify the bonds that we see. What are the bonds that you see in 2A? Okay, we have CH. Does anybody see any other bonds? That's quite all right. We're trying to go as simply as possible to be able to an analyze this question. Okay. So a CH bond is what type of bond? A nonpolar covalent bond. If we look at the other one, B, what are our types of bonds? CH and OCH is not a bond because OCH is three atoms. What is a bond? The connection between two atoms. So OCH is not a bond. What is the bond? Oxygen to carbon. Oxygen to carbon. O to C. When we go through and look at the CH bond, that is a nonpolar covalent bond. Right? When we look at the O to C bond, that is a polar covalent bond. And this is where you get people using polar versus nonpolar. Okay, well, the first one was nonpolar because it was a nonpolar covalent bond. The second one had a polar covalent bond. Okay, so that means it's polar. That means it has a lower or a higher melting point. Well, as a higher melting point, what would that suggest about the strength of the polar covalent bond then? If it has a higher melting point. It would be stronger, which based off of our conversation last week, not true. The polar covalent bond is actually weaker than the nonpolar covalent bond. Okay? So it perpetuates falsehoods behind the concepts happening within this. Okay? So we have to be very careful when we go through to look at our physical properties. Physical properties are based on intermolecular forces. So what are the forces at play? If you have a nonpolar covalent bond, what force do you have? A London dispersion force. If we have a nonpolar covalent bond, what kind of force do you have? A London dispersion force. If you have a polar covalent bond, what kind of force do you have? Dipole dipole. If you find you have a dipole dipole force, what should you consider? Do you have hydrogen bonding? Is there a hydrogen bound to oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine in an O to C bond? No, which means not hydrogen bonding. So when we look at the first one, 2A, we're like, well, there's only one force. That's the only force we can look at. For 2B, we have two forces. Which of those forces is going to be more important to how it interacts with other molecules? Say that again? OC. The OC bond, which leads to the dipole-dipole force. So we're now comparing a dipole-dipole force to a London dispersion force. Which is the stronger force? dipole dipole which means when I go through to melt it I have to put more energy in to 2b to cause it to melt 
That means 2B has the higher melting point or boiling point. Right? It's going back to labeling the forces and identifying those. This is a hugely critical chemistry concept right, that applies to virtually all interactions we see. Massively important to biology because that's how biology works is through these forces. So having an understanding of where they're coming from and not using stupid terms like polar and nonpolar Right? allows us to advance and actually come to decent conclusions. Right? When we move up to 1, 1 becomes a lot harder because if we go through and evaluate the bonds in both 1A and 1B, same. they're the same. Right? And in both cases, we're going to get London dispersion forces. So we would say they're both incredibly weak, which means, well, I can't tell a difference. Right? Well, let's go back to 2A versus 2B. Okay? London dispersion force is an incredibly weak force. Is a two-year-old incredibly weak? Yes. Cool. So our London dispersion force is a two-year-old with a knife. <laughs> 2B, we have a dipole-dipole force. Is that a strong force? Yeah, dipole-dipole force is relatively stronger. Okay? So that's a teenager with a knife. <laughs> Which one are you going to be more concerned about? Okay? And we don't care about the, the other person with the knife. You're going to be scared, more scared of the teenager. Because the teenager can probably have a larger effect on you, so you're going to deal with them first. Okay? So that is the primary interaction. Okay? If we move up to one, well, now it's the two-year-old in both cases. So how would I be able to differentiate? Well, what else is different between 1A and 1B? There's more stuff there. So this isn't just one two-year-old versus one two-year-old. This is one two-year-old versus five or six two-year-olds. Well, now, which one are you more concerned about? Okay. The gang of them is now going to have a larger effect. Okay. So when we're talking about melting points and boiling points, it's not just the strength of the interaction. It's also how much is present. When we're talking about these interactions, as far as the class is concerned, we only focus on the strength. One is there just to say, hey, it's not just strength. We also have these other things to consider. Are there still more things that have to be considered? Yes. Okay. Maybe the two-year-old has his arms tied behind his back. Okay. That's going to change how I'm going to interact. I'm probably not going to be all that concerned about that kid. Right? If he's hog-tied to the ground, yeah. not really worried. I don't care how many knives he's got. Okay? So there are other things that we have to consider in that larger scheme. And you might be saying, well, two-year-olds have nothing to do with structures. They're, they're pretty much the same thing. Okay? We're looking at that relationship between any two things. Why pick two-year-olds? Have you seen a two-year-old? Probably. Have you seen a carbon atom? No. No. So if we can scale that up to a system that allows us to interact, even if it's a little bit of humor, hey, it works out. Okay, or fear, depending on your level of oh distrust of two-year-olds. I just want to see a gang of two-year-olds with knives now. <laughs> I don't. Okay. Does that kind of make sense? So what you need to be able to go through and do is look at a structure or a formula, identify the bonds, once you know the bonds, you know the forces, now you can evaluate. You've got a comparison that you can go through and make. Kind of make sense? Okay. So, questions? Um, so, for the first question, so more bonds would be a higher melting point? I don't like how you phrase that. You're saying more bonds has a higher melting point. What dictates melting point? The forces. So by saying more bonds, you're now tying two things that don't work. Okay? More bonds means more opportunities for that molecule to make interactions or make forces with other molecules. Okay? So they're related. They're not the same thing. Okay? So more bonds means more forces. More forces means higher melting point and boiling point. Does that make sense? Okay? And that, that line is a hard line to distinguish. That is why chemistry faculty screw it up and start referencing polar and nonpolar because it's easier to say it's the bonds. It's not the bonds. 
Okay, that's where we run into big misconceptions with how chemistry functions. Okay, it's the forces. Okay, other questions? Okay, so we'll go ahead and pause lecture for the moment. Did we do heat versus temperature? I didn't think I showed this. Okay. This is our, our very brief, I'm gonna say I'm very serious about the very brief discussion of kind of energy. We look at heat versus temperature. All right, and we'll pick something that's a little bit easier to work with. Let's start with a liquid. Liquid water. Uh, at, you know, room temperature. Let's just say that's 25 degrees Celsius. What happens if I start removing heat? What happens to that liquid water? So if I remove heat, where would I move my dot? It goes down. Okay. So I'm going to say no to the down because we didn't say anything about what happened to temperature. If I just remove heat, Heat is only on the x-axis. So if I remove heat, where do I move? I move to the left. Okay, so if we're talking about just removing heat, I would move just to the left. What happens to the liquid water if I remove heat? What's that? The temperature goes down. So if I remove heat, I would see that temperature going down. So I would probably see something along those lines. Okay? And it goes down until what happens? Until what? No. No, I'm still removing heat. What happens? Nothing. Just gets colder and colder and colder. Does this go down to room temperature or the? State? We started at room temperature. If I get cold enough, what happens? changes phase in terms, or if I remove heat for long enough, what happens? It changes phase to a solid, okay? What happens at that point that I reach zero degrees Celsius? Does it all instantly become a solid? No, what do I still have to do? I still have to remove heat, right? What's happening with the temperature during that process? It gets lower? Can I still have a liquid at negative 2 degrees Celsius? No. So as I remove heat, as soon as I hit that 0 degrees Celsius, okay, what happens? As I continue to remove heat, what's going to happen to the temperature? Okay. That one's a harder one because few of us or less of us have experienced that one. So let's try the other direction. As I add heat, what happens to the temperature? It goes up, okay, until what happens? Until I reach 100 degrees Celsius, right? Okay, so as soon as I hit 100 degrees Celsius, all of the liquid turns into a gas. No. no. Do I stop adding heat? No, so I still add heat. If I'm still adding heat, where does my line go? But then that means the temperature continues to rise. So if I'm adding heat, pot of water, that water goes beyond 100 degrees Celsius? No, it boils. But what happens to the temperature during that boiling process? It stays constant. Am I still adding heat? Yes. So what happens? Ah, I get a flat line. What is happening during that flat line? The water is becoming drenched. This is a phase change. That flat line is the phase change on going from a liquid to a gas. As I continue to add heat to the gas, what happens to the gas? Temperature goes back up. Okay. So when we think about heat, what we have to do is recognize that heat can be used to do multiple things. It can be used to increase the temperature or decrease the temperature. Okay. It can also be used to force a phase change. What is happening at that phase change? What are we doing? Okay, what's, what's that heat doing, though? If it's not going in to increase the temperature, what is that heat being used to do? 
What's causing the phase change? What's preventing that phase change? What is the heat doing during that phase change? Does this involve the whole intermolecular forces that talks about our physical properties like phase changes? Yes! I know we just had that break with a little quiz thing in there, but if we go back and watch the video, we go directly from intermolecular forces into heat versus temperature. That phase change is making or breaking, depending on which direction we're going, those IMFs, those intermolecular forces. Right? We see the spike in temperature with the gas because what's the heat being used to do? Well, there's no more intermolecular forces to make or break, so the heat is just going into a temperature change. That's why the temperature goes up. The temperature is stagnant at the phase change because that heat is now being used to break forces. I can't use it to change the temperature because it's already getting used somewhere else. Okay? When we look at the cooling process, I'm taking that liquid and I cool it down. Eventually I hit zero degrees Celsius. And at that zero degrees Celsius, what happens? I'm still removing energy from the system. I'm removing energy in the form of, again, in this case, now making okay, or breaking our intermolecular forces for that phase transition. That phase transition is now the liquid to solid phase transition. What happens once it's all now a solid and I continue to remove heat? It, stays a solid it does stay a solid. Does the graph only have one thing on it? No. What happens is I continue to remove heat. The temperature continues to drop, really? I can get ice colder than zero degrees Celsius? Yeah. yeah, just like I can get gas hotter than 100 degrees Celsius. Okay? Those points that we've memorized on our zero and 100 are just the phase transition. That phase transition is referencing the intermolecular forces. Temperatures continue to go off either end of that. Okay? So I end up seeing the temperature again drop. Okay? What we've got here is a heat versus temperature or phase transition diagram that allows us to see the relationship between heat and temperature. If you have to move into 151, guess what you get to do with this diagram? Sort of. You get to tell me how much heat that is. You get to give me a number. And by me, you don't get to give it to me because I don't like teaching this. You also get to give me a number for how much energy it requires to do the phase transition. Every substance has a different energy for those phase transitions. Why would it have a different energy? Why might there be a different energy for each of the phase transitions for each substance? They all have different intermolecular forces. Because you're breaking different forces, you get different energy terms for each of those interactions. Okay. Based off our first law of thermodynamics, we can't create or destroy energy. Thank you, Einstein. Okay. Uh, we can now quantify how energy changes from one phase to another. How we can get energy going from a solid going into a liquid, well, that's going to change energy. Where does that energy go or come from? Well, it's going to come from the surroundings and how we monitor them. So we can set up relationships that allow us to dictate and predict changes in temperature based off of an individual substance. And that's kind of cool, okay? Kind of cool, theoretically. I just don't want to deal with the numbers, okay? But that's what 152 talks about is how do we predict those systems, okay? You got a question there, Drew? Yeah, so well, this is the first time same thing substance and it'll be getting heat but the temperature won't be changing until the bonds are all broken down or Shh. fix this statement <laughs> the forces, the forces. forces not bonds okay 
We can constantly be adding or removing heat and have the temperature not change because something else is changing. That something else is those intermolecular forces, either allowing them to form or allowing them to break, okay? depending on which transition you're going through. So then if something isn't breaking down, if the forces aren't being broken down, the temperature should, the, you know the temperature's going to be increasing or decreasing. Whatever. Yes. If those forces aren't breaking, then yes, you're getting a temperature change. I don't know why, but this is the first time in the four times we've gone through this material. Like, I remember the graph, but that principle did not connect. That's really cool. I'm geeking out now. Yeah. I think I did talk about it a little bit better this time, okay. to be honest. In your defense. That's just, it's really cool. Okay. So, it's kind of neat. You can quantify it. Fun stuff like that. Okay. After that, back to our intermolecular forces. How else can we use these? Does this question look familiar to anybody? It should because... Oh, that's one of the questions I put on there? Oh, that's fun. That was kind of mean. But This comes from the practice final. Okay. Are you responsible for this? Yes. Yes. You need to be knowing how to do this. Okay, so let's break it down. This is one of my favorite questions from the practice final in this entire class because this involves a lot of thought behind it. Not only that, how much calculation needs to go into it? Zero. That's why it's so cool. Right? Pretty much anything that you can do through reasoning and ordering that thought, that's neat if you can do it without math, in my opinion. The logic and order behind math is still there, but that's not the argument I'm making. We don't have to deal with numbers. So, what are we being asked to do? Highest vapor pressure. So, step one. What do we want? What is vapor pressure? Yeah, what do we want? What is vapor pressure? What is pressure measure? Particles in the air, what did you say? Uh, force means that vapor pressure is a measure of the force. The force of what? The force of pressure, yes. The force of what? True. What thing is pushing on that container, though? Because if I take a container and I drop some milk in the bottom of it, is there any force, or drop some salt, is there any force from the salt on the top of the container? No, gravity. Okay. There is no force on the top of the container from the, from the salt. Why is the salt not exerting a force? What is the force that we're tying to pressure? What does it come from? It's a gas. That's literally what we're trying to figure out. This is a pressure. Pressure comes from the force of a gas. A gas. Right? We have to be able to identify that phase. Right? Why might that be weird? If we go back to the question, it's now referencing which of the following Liquid. liquids. If I have a liquid, why the hell am I talking about a gas? It's a vapor pressure. What is vapor pressure? It's the force of a gas coming from the liquid. Okay. And unfortunately, this shouldn't be making you think at this point because this is literally just the definition of that term. Okay. If we think about the amount of thought that you have to process through, this right here is at the bottom. This is what is the definition of that term. Okay, the next part that can come with this is do you have to know that definition? Yes. No. Did any of you know that definition and do we work our way through it? Yes. yes. You don't need to know the definition. You do need to know some concepts. Work with the concepts you do know to build on it. If you have a flaw somewhere, you can use logical reasoning to build through it. If you have that logical reasoning. If you don't have that logical reasoning, what happens? Because 
Nope, there were two ways to get what's written on the board so far. Logical reasoning and... Yes. Knowing the de definition. You had to have the content memorized. Right? What we've been trying to work with you on is come through basic, simple steps of logical reasoning to get to a definition so that you don't have to memorize. If you don't want to follow those logical steps, that is absolutely cool and fine. Guess what you get to do? Memorize. When we talk about dimensional analysis on how we solve for a density calculation, okay, we could memorize or we could follow the process of what are the units we're trying to get to, what is the information we have, make sure that aligns to get to that answer. If we don't have the logical skills, we have to memorize it. Okay? That's it. Those are two camps that you have to decide in. Okay? Ultimately, you should be taking a little bit from both. If you're not using either, you will fail the course. Okay? And arguably, you should fail all of your courses. Okay? You have to be proving some adeptness in one or the other category. Okay? So force is a gas from a liquid. Why would a gas be going to a liquid? Because it's cooling down. So is a gas coming from a liquid when I cool it down? When I cool down the gas, what does it do? It slows down and gets closer and it becomes? I'd argue solid's okay, but before it gets to that solid, it becomes a liquid. Right? So when we're talking about the force of the gas from a liquid is cooling down what we should be referencing. When we cool down, are we getting a gas from a liquid? No, we're getting... You're getting the liquid from the gas. You're thinking about it in the opposite direction it's being asked. Okay? It can still be solved that way, but the problem is, is you're doing it the opposite of what's being asked, which means you have to factor in the negative okay, into your answer. The problem with that, we don't do well with negatives. Okay? So don't focus on the negative, focus on the positive. How do I get a gas from a liquid? I add heat until I reach what? A boiling point. Where might I get a large gas force? If I think about the boiling point. Uh, let's pause. Do I want a large gas force? No. Read the question. What comes the word before vapor pressure? Highest, yeah. Highest vapor pressure. Do I want a lot of gas? Yes. yes. Because pressure measures? Force of a gas. Force of a gas. If I have a high pressure, what does that mean? I have lots of gas. Okay. Tie that to boiling point. If I have a large boiling point, a boiling point that is 50,000 degrees Celsius, how much gas will I have? To get to the gas, what do I have to achieve? I have to achieve the phase change. That phase change happens at that boiling point, which was what? 50,000 degrees Celsius. When was the last time you ever heard of 50,000 degrees Celsius as a temperature? The sun. What phase would you be at then if you never achieve the boiling point? A liquid. What do you want your boiling point to be? You want the boiling point to be low. Okay? How do you know or when would you have a low boiling point? What dictates the physical property of boiling point? Forces. Types of forces. So are intermolecular forces. To get a low boiling point, what kind of force do I want? I don't accept low. Right idea, wrong word. A weak force. Okay. The weakest force is going to be generated from which bond? Mm -hmm. 
I know where you're going with that, or at least where some of you are going from that. Which bond generates the weakest force? Where's our weakest force in the diagram to the left? London dispersion. How do I get a purple London dispersion force? Where must it come from? The strongest bond, a nonpolar covalent bond. Why is that helpful for me? I want the strongest bond. Weakest force is London dispersion. Strongest bond is nonpolar covalent. Why is that helpful? What are your answer choices? Our answer choices all show information about the type of bonds. So what you now have to go through and do is find the compound that has the most nonpolar covalent bonds. So really this question just says which of these is only nonpolar covalent. That's it. To get to that question, what did you have to do? All of this logical thought and work. Okay? That is why this question is incredibly cool and fascinating and interesting to me. You have to be able to think about each of those intricate stages along the way. Okay? If you have any w missing link in there, what happens? You'll get the question wrong or you're getting it right for entirely wrong reasons, okay? because you guessed. Okay? Intermolecular forces are massively important. They dictate all of our phase or our physical properties. Vapor pressure is a physical property. That logical thought process is what you need to be thinking about when you move through these. Okay? And just for giggles, What's your answer now? Why is this now a problem? All of them aren't just nonpolar covalent bonds. So we now have to think deeper and harder about this. We can't just go, oh, it's nonpolar covalent, so that must be the answer. We would now have to dig deeper into this. Okay? To dig deeper into this, I need the weakest intermolecular force. So what would I do for each of those? Go through and identify their forces. Okay? The force that I would get from that first one, because I have an OH bond, I have a polar covalent bond. A polar covalent bond leads to a dipole-dipole force. If I have a dipole-dipole force, I should evaluate if I have hydrogen bonding. Do I? Yes. Yes. So I have hydrogen bonding. And the next one, I have an OC bond. An OC bond is a polar covalent bond, which leads to a dipole-dipole force. Do I have hydrogen bonding? No. Between those two, what could I do? Which one? The hydrogen bonding should be eliminated because that has a stronger force, and I'm looking for the weaker force. Okay. Next one. That CL is connected to our carbon. We have a polar covalent bond, which is dipole-dipole. Next one, we have a sulfur carbon, which is polar covalent bond, which is dipole-dipole. How would we distinguish between those three? Do we have a rule set yet to figure that out? No. No. Will you get asked that on the test? No. Okay. So process through the information that you have to get through this. Does that make sense? Yes. So just to be clear, the answer was B before you erased it. Yes. The answer was B. Okay. Okay. 
This kind of question is one that I'll get students, oh, there's nothing to write down because there's no math. There is more to write for this question than any other math question. You should be writing more to solve this than a standard math question. Right? Because you have to address each of those intricate pieces. If you decide to not evaluate those pieces, you run the risk of doing a mismatch and getting the answer wrong. Okay? So you need to specify that information because it improves the odds of you getting the question right. Yes? For the C, D, and E one, won't you just find the mass and find like the largest one? So you can play with mass as a possibility, but this gets into the complications of ranking how you would evaluate your interactions. And so it becomes a lot more complicated. It's not just mass. Hi. It becomes a lot more complicated. I'm not going to address it because what you'll end up doing is using that to answer this question in the future, which is a horrible process because you should be evaluating it at the base level first. When you do that correctly, you will have finished all of your Gen Chem, which then means you can take OCHEM and we can have that conversation. Right? So solubility, like dissolves like. The best way to approach this is not like dissolves like. It's like forces dissolve like forces. Okay, so right out of the gate, what do you know from the statement like forces dissolve like forces? We know we need to be looking at forces. Okay, so a first read through of just looking at the English language and now doing some basic definition stuff, we should be looking at forces. Just by reading that statement, we can also come to another conclusion. Okay? They should be the same force. Why? Because it says like. Okay? Same force to do what? To dissolve. So if I have the same force, they dissolve. What else can we draw as a conclusion from just looking at that statement? There's more things that you would evaluate. It's complicated just like our intermolecular forces. What do you notice? When we go through and look at examples, what is special about all of the examples in black boxes? They all have H2O. Okay. Why might we see H2O frequently when we talk about solubility? Water is our most common liquid. Okay. Is that a guarantee? No. No. What else do they have in common? The CH. So Na is carbon? So they all have sodium. Okay. So when we talk about observations and making observations, everybody tries to make big observations. It's a really small observation. What do all those boxes have in common? Say that again. There's two things. Like forces dissolve like forces, which means to answer the question, what do I have to do? Look at two different things. If you're only looking at one thing, you're doing it wrong. You have to bring in two things. Okay? When we looked at boiling point, what did we evaluate? We looked at the uh, molecular forces. For one thing. When we're looking at solubility, what do we now have to look at? Two things. So solubility becomes twice as difficult. Because you now have to evaluate two pieces of information and align those two things with each other. If you decide to only evaluate one thing, you will get it wrong because you aren't following the basics of what the rule means. 
So when we look at that first box, upper left, like forces, what are the forces that you see for H2O? Hydrogen, Hydrogen bonding. That is a phenomenal answer. That's where you should be right now. You're jumping straight to the force. Next one, what do you see? CH is a bond, not a force, okay? Which isn't wrong, but what you've done is kind of regressed a little bit. That's fine, it's a more complicated structure. If we have CH, what kind of bond would we have? What kind of bond would we have? Nonpolar covalent, which would lead to what kind of force? London dispersion forces, okay? That's okay. Okay, but in that regression, we also have to remember that's only evaluating one of the bonds within that entire structure. Are there more bonds in that structure? No. Yes. What else do we have in there? We have the OH. The OH is a polar covalent bond, which leads to dipole-dipole, which leads to hydrogen bonding. Is hydrogen bonding similar to hydrogen bonding? Yeah. Yes, which means? They dissolve. Welcome to 21. Yay. If you don't get that reference, we'll worry about it later. Next one. What is the force in H2O? H. Hydrogen bonding. What is the force in CH3, CH2, CH3? London dispersion. Are those similar forces? Yes. Here's London dispersion. Here's hydrogen bonding. Black and green, roughly the same color. Like ballpark. No. no. What does that mean? They're not, the same. They're not the same, which means they don't mix. Okay. You can encounter this other term, solubility and miscibility. Solubility is officially the term for anything dissolving in a liquid. Anything. Miscibility is a liquid dissolving in a liquid. Is miscibility the same thing as solubility? No. Or could be. Yes. What is solubility? Anything dissolving in a liquid. Is miscibility the same thing as solubility? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Anything is a liquid. Is solubility the same thing as miscibility? No. 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 Miscibility is a narrower definition. Okay. It can get thrown at you. Treat it the exact same because we aren't really expecting you to be able to predict phases out of these. Okay? The ionic compounds get a little bit trickier because we'd say ionic versus hydrogen bonding. Is green the same thing as red? No. Not really. But is yellow the same thing as orange? Close. Okay, they're getting closer. Okay? When we talk about ionic compounds, for the most part, they are water soluble. Right? There are exceptions. Those exceptions would be known as? Miscibility would be looking at a liquid dissolving in a liquid. In all ionic compounds, we would expect to be what phase? You're like, damn, that's hard. What intermolecular force do you have in an ionic compound? In an ionic compound? Yep. What's the intermolecular force in ionic compounds? Ionic. What is the strength of the ionic force? The strongest. If it's the strongest force, that's going to require a ton of energy to cause it to change phases. What might we expect the phase is for our ionic compounds? Solids. Solids. Kind of like salt, sodium hydroxide, sodium carbonate, calcium chloride. They're all solids, okay? Because they have exceptionally strong intermolecular forces, okay? So what we're doing is looking at the relationship between those forces to come up with predictions about those physical properties and fun stuff like that. Okay. Water and solubility, we've officially talked about already, okay, but we can use something like this. When you read this question, how many structures do you see? Structures? Yep. Five. You might say five because there's five answers, which... But before we do that, one of them is wrong. Or, oh, sorry, four of them are wrong, which means how many structures do you see? One. One. But solubility involves what things? Two. Two. What's the second structure? Water. 
You have to read the question to realize the second compound to get that second force. Sometimes it's not inherently obvious. Read carefully. With that, we're going to have to go ahead and stop.